Uh, so I'm going to call this meeting to order the October 2nd Development Review Board for the City of Montpelier. Um, I'm going to have Meredith do the remote attendee uh, staff review of how to get in, and then we'll do a roll call. Okay. All right. The screen I'm sharing is more for people who are watching via Orca Media, um, but the text you can hear the stuff I'm going to say is for everybody um all right so for those who are viewing tonight's development review board meeting via Orca Media you can participate in tonight's discussion via the Zoom platform using either the video or telephone access options if you want to be able to make use of the video options, then you're going to want to type this link into your web browser. Um, and that should bring you right into the meeting. Um, if you need to, there might be a place to put in a meeting ID, but that, that shouldn't have to happen if you type in this link. Um, and I'll get a little notification to let you into the Zoom meeting. Alternatively, you can dial this phone number and then punch in this meeting ID. Um, and I will, again, get a little message. And with the phone version, you'll be able to hear us and speak to us. Um, you just won't have the share screen options. Um, if anybody is watching via Orca and they're having problems accessing tonight's meeting, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. For those who are attending via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. And if you're having bandwidth issues where there's lag and everything, I actually suggest you turn your own camera off and that should help a great deal. You'll still be able to see us. Um, we just won't be able to see you. For those, everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will reduce background noise. If you've called in via the phone, you can use star six to mute or unmute yourself. Um, please reserve the Zoom chat function for troubleshooting or logistics questions. Um, if someone on tonight has a question or comment about a specific item on the agenda, please raise your hand either physically if you have your camera on or by using the re raise hand button on your toolbar. Um, and for those of you who call in on the phone, if you press star nine, that will show a little raise hand um, for us here using Zoom. Um, and then once you've been called on by the chair, please make sure to state your name. Um, once you've unmuted yourself, state your name and um, your address for the record, um, and then um, you can provide your comments or questions um, on the particular agenda item. In the event the public is unable to access tonight's meeting, um, it will need to be continued to a time, place, and certain. Um, I'll now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Great, thank you. Um, I guess uh, let's just do a roll call of uh, DRB members. Um, my screen just started flipping around crazily here. Uh, Rob, do you want to state your name? I'm Rob Goodwin, Vice Chair. Great. Kevin? Kevin O'Connell, uh, board member. Uh, uh, Alex, I think you're next there. You Got to unmute Alex. <laughs> Alex Halas, board member. Great. Uh, Catherine? Catherine Burgess, board member. Joe? Uh, Joe Kiernan, board member. Uh, Brian Jones? <laughs> Brian, are you there? Apparently not. Oh, I think he's, he's, he's here. He's just not unmuted. Maybe he had to step away for a second. OK. Uh, Gene? Hello, everyone. Gene Leon, board member. Great. Um, I hope the board members have had an opportunity to uh, review the uh, agenda. Were there any um, comments or changes in that? I'll make a motion Thank to you. accept the agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those not in favor? And it passes unanimously. I'm okay. sorry. Who who actually seconded that? Rob, Rob, I thought. Rob did. Okay, Rob. great. Thank you. I I can't write and look at the screen at the same time. 
you can't. <laughs> okay. Um, so our first application tonight is uh, 41 College Street. Uh, the owner is Vermont College of Fine Arts, and the applicant is the New School of Montpelier. Um, and we, I'd like to get people sworn in. Um, and I'd like to uh, see who is here uh, that wants to testify for that. So we've got um, uh, Elias, great, Mark, um, Jeff, okay, Mark, Elias, Jeff. Anybody else I'm missing? Can you see that, Mary? Nope. Okay. Uh, so what I think we'll do first is uh, everybody who'd like to testify, if you could raise your right hand and, and do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Okay. Yes, I do. also, oh, Jeff, okay, Mark, yeah, great. Jeff. Okay. Um, so what uh, what I'd like to have happen here is have Meredith give us a quick overview of the project, and then we'll ask whoever, um, I think it's Elias, is here for the applicant, is the applicant. Uh, so we'll turn it over to him at that point. Um, so you want to go ahead, Meredith? Yeah, so this is just an administrative overview. Um, so this application is coming before the Development Review Board because of two key items. Um, the addition is adding two buildings that are already larger than the standard maximum footprint for the zoning district, um, but there's no limit to how big of a footprint waiver the board can approve. Um, so it's a, it's a judgment call and, and question about you know the specifics of this project. So something the board needs to decide on. Uh, second is that the applicant is requesting a um, height waiver for a fence in the rear. Um, the board can approve an eight foot fence in the rear, the zoning administrator cannot. The other item just to note um, is that the design review committee has made recommendations um, for this project because it is in the design review overlay district. Um, normally, if this were just an administrative approval, um, I just take those recommendations and as long as the applicant doesn't disagree with them, they just become conditions of the permit. The Development and Review Board has greater um, ability to make adjustments, so the DRB has some options on how it wants to deal with those recommendations. They can be just findings of fact of what the um, applicant um, has agreed to. It could be a finding of fact of this is what the design review committee uh, recommended, but the applicant is requesting something else. So there's going to need to be some discussion or it can become a condition of approval. Um, you know, there's, there's a variety of ways the board can go with those. So those are the three key features. Otherwise, this application would just be um, an administrative site plan um, approval for the addition. Great, thank you. Um, Elias, do you want to uh, speak about the application? Just sort of give us, uh, you know, what you're what you're applying for and what you're looking for. Yeah. So, I mean, New School of Montpelier is we're, we're purchasing forty one and forty five College, and we're would like to build a, an elevator and connector in between the buildings for accessibility purposes. Um, and we're also trying to build a, a small courtyard and back for our students to be able to safely play without risk of them uh, bolting out into the community. But sort of cover what you want or you want more details? Um, I, I, maybe just a little bit more detail about um, the actual, uh, like the building that you're adding on there would be great. Yeah, I would probably defer to Mark because I think you you can say okay. it. <laughs> That would be uh, that would be great. Um, unless board members have questions, particularly for Elias at this point. All right, uh, Mark, you're up. Yeah. So the connector we're proposing uh, is between Bishop Hatch Hall and Alumni Hall. It will connect the the basement level of both buildings, which are more or less at the same elevation, and it will connect the main gymnasium level of alumni hall with level one of bishop and they're roughly a foot off from each other um, the connector itself is 
basically only going to have two floors in at the basement and then the first floor, and then it will have a landing at level two and three of Bishop Hatch Hall. So the elevator provides accessibility to all four levels of Bishop and the two levels of Alumni Hall. Uh, we're proposing uh, a glazed connector um, between uh, the buildings such that you'll be able to see through it um, from west to east. And that will also allow, as you're out on College Street or uh, on the back side of the building, you'll be able to see the, the historic elevations of both buildings uh, from outside through through the glazing. That covers what you need or? Yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, so this is, I just want to go through some of the, uh, you guys received the staff report earlier as well. Okay. okay. Um, one of the things that we should look at here. So the, yeah, so this is basically the first part of this is just Meredith saying that this is, um, is a minor site plan approval. Um, in the first overlay in the zoning districts, um, we talk about additions to a distinct building shall respect and be compatible with the size, scale, materials, detailing, overall character of the primary building. Um, and shall not obscure or undermine the central form or character of the original building, which I think you were sort of just referring to um, when you talked about the glaze, that being able to see that uh, and should reflect the addition's time period and style as well. Um, and did board members have concerns or questions about the uh, architectural features or the outside, the exterior appearance of the project? Okay. Um, is this where the color becomes relevant, or is that we're, we're getting it. that's next? Okay. <laughs> um, so then the next the next issue is uh, what Meredith was talking about in terms of um, what was recommended by the um, by the design review committee. Um, and you know, I would actually appreciate seeing on a map where the fence is being proposed. Is that something you can pull up, Meredith? Thank you. Um, just for the record, did the applicant agree with the design review committee's recommendations? Um. New School doesn't really have an opinion. Um, that said, I, I personally wonder whether a darker color really meets what the design committee wants. If you look in the page of the packet that shows the elevator that was built behind Schumeyer, you can also see a dark window. And to me, the dark window stands out a lot more than the white elevator, which I think were sort of the two options being discussed. But what, whatever you see is best, we're happy to do. I'm sorry, who's talking? Sorry, this is Elias Gardner. From okay, I just wasn't sure if there was somebody else. I heard, heard something somewhere there. Um, so where's the fence on this? So uh, this is the front, right? So here's College Street is down here. So this is that front sort of portico. Here's the stepped back building. And the yeah. fenced in area is here in the back in the L shape of the rear of... Um, uh, what, 41? Okay. 41. So there's a fence here and here. So you won't see it from the front at all. It's something you'll see just from the parking lot space. Um, and there were elevations as well. Sorry, I got to scroll. I hope <laughs> nobody gets motion sick. Um, so here's a view of the fence. Let me zoom in a little bit. Um, so this is from the rear. So here's where the addition will be. Um, here's uh, 45, here's 41, and this is a L. So this part sticks out a little bit more towards the, the parking lot and here's fencing. Okay, great. Thank you, that's very helpful. Is You're welcome. Fencing for like a courtyard? That's What's the that? intention is that it would make a courtyard where we can have students, like a student play area. Right on, thank you. 
Is there anybody else who wants to speak or question about that? Um, Alex, you had some concern about the color? Oh, Alex, you're muted. You got to uh, unmute, yeah. Got it. Um, I go. just wanted to make sure that we talked about it. I mean, I, for one, don't see any problem with white, but I don't have a strong opinion. It could also be nice in burnt orange. I mean, so I'm sort of <laughs> not sure what the rationale behind the color recommendation is. Um, and I That's take exactly. the point that was made that with the reflective surface of the glass, the brown or gray is going to look different. Right. I mean, it'll be hard to tell where the cladding stops and the glass starts if there's no interior light. So it will just be a dark mass. Okay. Um, so hey, Lord, I'm, sorry? I'm struggling to see in the regs where we, as a DRB, decide the color. So it's from. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, I, this is about this is not about the color, but I just uh, wanted to know what the what the uh, purpose of the fence is. Is it security? Is it what what exactly? Elias, do you want to answer that? Yes. So we with the student population we work with, some of our students have a tendency to run away and the fence is a way for them to safely play outside without risking them running into the street. Oh, okay. That, that's what I was looking for. And, and that also is the reason for the height because yeah, eight feet, will, eight feet's a big fence. Yeah. And we have students who will easily climb a six foot fence right. is the issue. Okay. That's helpful to know. Okay. All right. So that's, um, I, I, just for the board, I, I would, um, I mean, the DRC has reviewed this and using their their best judgment has have made a recommendation. I, I can't say that I am you know in lockstep with that, but on the other hand, uh, if if it's all the same, why not just go with with their recommendation? Okay, well, that is uh, there are there other people that feel strongly about that, whether we I mean, I think in general, we do try to. Um, go with the development design review committee's right uh, suggestion. Um, uh, Elias, when you met with the design review committee, did you um, did you talk about your concerns about like it not going quite as well as maybe maybe the white wood or no? Because I hadn't really processed um, that. It was really the picture behind Schumeyer that has made me think about it, which I think is in your packet. I also want to point out, I think Meredith's got something to say. She set her hand up for a bit. Okay. All right. Well, let um we will keep that as part of the process here as we go along. Um, seven. That's that. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, I, I think yep. separate from my comment, Jeff Oleski has his hand up, and he might actually be bringing up the thing I was going to bring up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's. I I couldn't see him. I'm sorry. And uh, uh Jess, go ahead. What is it, Lupa? Yeah, and, and um, you know, just my two cents. Again, I'm just a civil engineer. I defer to Mark, uh, the architect, and, and Elias's preferences to, to, as regards to the trim color of this edition. A couple of things I just wanted to point out that came up as part of the DRC review and that will be coming up as part of future review with this is that you know the both of the existing buildings that we're tying onto are brick. Uh, facade with a white trim context. And I think that was the intent of, of the proposed white trim was to at least tie into the trim of the existing buildings. And, and we feel collectively the design team, that was the aesthetic that, that fit best. Again, I don't think uh, Elias or New School have a hard preference. And if, if the decision is it has to be black or a darker color, they will certainly do that. The only thing I, I wanted to point out, or the reason I raised my hand, was that keep in mind that as part of the review of this project, this will need to go through the Department of Historic Preservation. And they may very well end up having an opinion themselves 
about what the trim or the uh, aesthetic of that may be. And the only thing I would be concerned about is if this board said it had to be black and then the Department of Forest Historic Preservation said it had to be white, we may ultimately run into a crossroads where we're coming back to one or two or, or butting heads against each other. So, right. so take that information exactly. for what it's what it's worth. I just wanted to point that out that there's another level of of state review on the aesthetic of this as well. And, and maybe Mark's got something more to add to yeah. that. I'll, I'll bow out. I think I think that is a very good point. Um, so that I mean that kind of uh, makes me feel like I would, you know, if it is going to the historic review as well to give them the room to have it whatever color they, if they were to insist on a color. And I don't, you know, I'm with Alex. I don't, I don't really care what color it is, you know. Um, uh, what do other board members think about that? I don't, I don't know that it's our decision to reflect our opinion on what color it is. I, I I think we leave it up in the air and I'll let the, the process decide as to what what color it ends up being. Um that's 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 my I you know look at the regs. I I just don't see where in our purview of the DRB we we make we make that decision. Um we let that let that fall where it falls. I I agree with Rob. Um I was gonna ask Meredith, are either the design review committee or the historic preservation committee is anything they say absolutely binding? Um, so the design review committee is advisory, right? Okay. So they advise if it's an administrative permit, unless something that they're advising is in clear uh, conflict with an actual regulation, I just put it on as a condition of the, of the permit. Um, the board the board has the discretion to to figure out what to do with that recommendation. That's beyond me in general, unless there's a clear, clear conflict. And just for clarity with what um, Jeff was noting about additional historic review, that's his state historic preservation office okay. review. Um, and so theirs will be binding because it goes to a state permit. Um, and so my, I'm, I'm glad that th thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. Cause that's what I was going to, what is what I was going to bring up is that, you know, it, what it might be is that the board can say as a finding of fact, this is what the design review committee has recommended. So it's in the file, it's in the record and the applicant can take that to the state to say, this is what our local design review people have requested, but then ultimately it's a state decision about the 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 color so could we also just not make it a condition right exactly it's not right. a condition it's a finding okay. of fact that this is what the design review committee recommended the board is fine with that as a recommendation it is not a condition of approval okay so yeah i was gonna say i agree with rob that you know we should kind of leave this in the hands of of other groups I suppose the only thing I'm concerned about is it ending up black because personally I agree with um, what was said earlier about matching the trim color and everything. I, I don't know why I wasn't there. They wanted it to be black. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel like as a development review board member, we have kind of a responsibility what these things do end up looking like uh, for the rest of the public. And I, 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 was that their suggestion that they paint it black or just un, were they just trying to spitball something different? Like they just didn't like the white. Can I, do you want me to speak to that or do you want Elias to speak to that? Either one, whoever was there. Yeah, no, I, cause I staff that. So okay, yeah. my understanding, and this is something that I've heard from them for other additions on historic buildings, especially something like this, where it's kind of like set back already is that the white is going to make it stand out more. Having it something that's closer in color to maybe the roof, especially with something that already has so much glass, um, if the paneling on the sides and the, the frame structure around all that glass is a darker color, their opinion is that that would make it more disappear, sort of recess into the background. This was their opinion, right? Um, yeah. It, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily what's going to happen. Um, Mark has his hand up, and then I okay. think Catherine does, Sharon. Okay. Yeah, I think just to that point, and, and I certainly respect that position and, and can understand it, and I think in reality, 
we can make white aluminum or, or black charcoal aluminum look just is good either way but one thing i want to point out is this is essentially the new front door to the to the new school and so the part of the thought behind the white in addition to picking up the white trim on the existing buildings was that this addition is back off the road and it's between two buildings it's already recessed and so if it's dark in color which the glazing will be it's going to go away more and so by using the white mullions you're going to make it stand out a little bit more which will actually make it a more welcoming entrance so right, great. that's but that's uh -huh. i understand that's an aesthetic so all right i also just realized i was looking at the wrong sheet and misidentifying what this was actually going to look like i see the glass now and everything um so but the first thing i said was i agree with rob it, it does seem out of our purview when there's other committees that are more dedicated to this thing okay i'd like to get catherine too yeah that's my same point i think this is um out of our traditional area of expertise so i'm glad we're talking about it especially with the functionality of this being the entrance but I agree. We need to defer to design with you. Okay. So does that land us with us basically uh, using the design review committee's input as a finding of fact, and then it goes to the historical society and they make whatever decision they make. Is that is that basically where we're at? That I, that would that would be my take on it. Okay. I actually <laughs> think. We should be clear about not um, either rubber stamping the design review committee or fighting with them, and that it's not in our purview. Yeah. It's not an endorsement, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm no, not. I, agree with I don't. That. I would rather leave it to the applicant and their architects to think through um, the design issues, because I think the argument about it being a main entrance and it's being therefore needing to be visible is an important one. Yeah. And, and I, I also would think that we would be proud of the yeah. fact that it was a handicapped yeah. accessible building, that it had been converted in that way. Okay. Did somebody else want to comment? Oh, uh, hi, guys. Uh, I was hi, just Brian. saying, um, I kind of second that, too. I mean, I think that it's, uh, it, for all the reasons that have been said, and it's certainly not an unprecedented choice to use that color, right, in the palette. It's also very much a part of the palette of, of the campus. So, you know, it's not like anybody's saying, hey, let's make it bright pink or green or something out by, you know, it's just leave it leave it to the design folks and, um, and, and keep moving, yeah, so. Great. Meredith, do you have your hand up? It looked like you did. No, yep, okay. I, I do. I do. I do. Okay. Um, so just a reminder, in this instance, the board has has the benefit of this going through another review at the state level for the design aspects. At some point, and this has happened previously, although I think it was a few years ago, if an applicant and the design review committee disagree about how one of those design standards is being applied, the DRB steps in as basically the appeal board. So at some point, you may all have to actually make a decision on design. Just letting you know, here you have the benefit of being able to sort of pass the buck. Um, so you're you're in a good good spot. And I think that is the great, you know, the a good way to go here. Just letting you know that you don't always have that option. <laughs> That's fine. That's great. <laughs> Um, any more questions about that? Okay, so we're going to move on here. Uh, where, that was the color. Uh, we are on erosion already. So we are on to, um, General standards and special use, um, basically, uh, special use standards, um, section 3002J and figure 306 allowed the board to grant building footprint waivers of any requested amount within the bounds of 4602 and the criteria figure 4 02. Granting the footprint requires that the larger footprint will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located, substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of adjacent properties, reduce access to renewable energies, or develop or be detrimental to the public welfare. 
so it, it seems that in actuality, uh, you're going to decrease the um, previous impervious surfaces. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, and then the other part, uh, this is the, they're going to be adding uh, 708 square feet uh, to a currently non-conforming building. Um, board thoughts about that? Uh, in particular, okay. Um, it seems uh, so. We have to uh, determine whether the requested footprint wire uh, waiver complies with the relevant criteria. Um, and I, I, I definitely agreed with the uh, staff suggestion here that making the buildings fully uh, ADA accessible is a is a good goal, uh, Catherine. Yeah, that, since you're calling for board input, that was going to be my primary point. It's an additional area to make the building more accessible uh, to a key user of the building and to the public. So I think it's, uh, you know, I think we should celebrate that. Right. That's a good thing. Okay. Um, so when we get to the fence part, um, it seems um, from the applicant's description that it's a really good reason to have an eight-foot fence. Um, and it's material, you know, it matches up, so they're not using any strange strange fencing stuff, so that's good. Um, anybody have any problems with the uh, changing or giving them a waiver from six foot to eight foot on the fencing? No. 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 I think it's a major improvement. I think I like the courtyard idea. I think the whole engineering yeah. and design is, is 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 just a major improvement and convenience too to the students. Okay, excellent. Okay, now we get into the steep slopes section. Um, so, can we look at the map of where uh, where it does disturb the um, slopes? Yeah, so, let me just scroll to it. Give me a minute. Okay. It's a very small area for right. the um, stormwater outlet. And Meredith, that's sheet C2.1, if it helps at all. I think it's the fourth sheet. <laughs> in the set. Yeah. And I so also have this. Ask, uh, oh. oh, go ahead. Catherine? I had a navigation question on the fence before we move on. Typically, I've got all these printouts, but today I'm using the PDF, which is harder, of course. For the um, eight-foot tall fence, by the way, that is really only, that is um, indicated on uh, page 30 out of 81. It is um, it is only that uh, rectangular area in the right of the plan, correct? The top right yep. of the plan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I want to make sure I wasn't missing it somewhere else with the PDF dynamic. Great. Yeah, on this that I'm showing right now, it's right here. There's the fenced area. Okay. All right. Uh, Versus the this the the they're showing a different fence here. This is for project demarcation for like when they're doing the project and building this area, right? They've got, they'll have this fenced off a little bit. Um, and this is sort of for erosion control aspects. Um, but the fence that will be permanent is here and here. Um, for the slopes, right here is this little tiny bit of steep slopes. It was steep enough um, to require an engineered plan it on itself may or may not have required DRB approval. It was a little iffy whether or not there's actually 30% or more slopes here. Um, but since it was already coming to you, we did the full engineered plan. Um, the only thing that is noted in the staff report is that to get this, the official engineered plan will need um, stamped plans. Okay. Um, and that no undo uh, the, no, what is the, line sorry uh the letter of 
no undue adverse impact on slope stability and safety. So it's a, a little bitty letter pretty much that um, can be conditions of approval of that and the stamp plans prior to permit issuance. Okay. Um, that looks good then. Uh, so the requirements of three, eight, 3008 have been met as an erosion prevention and sediment control plan is triggered by proposed addition. Engineering plan has been provided. Seems like we're uh, and Department of Works was fine with that, so we are all set to go there. I think um, stormwater management. Uh, that's uh, that didn't change very much. Right? Uh, there was a reduction in impervious uh, impervious amount of surface in the site. Um, so in actuality, it's slightly improved, um, and they're going to use the existing stormwater design right is that correct well yeah i mean they're doing that new where that new the steep slopes that area little, right that little yeah thing. that's that that's yeah, a okay. new thing that they're putting in but it's generally this this water's flowing to the same direction jeff if okay. i'm misunderstanding that speak up but that's my injury feed of the whole thing yeah no you're absolutely correct the, the the concept of the collection and the discharge point is the exact same we're just having to replace the line because the existing line is undersized and di dilapidated essentially um, and so we're having, but that being said, there's also large utilities, uh, natural gas within the, that are above the existing drainage lines. So we're having to reroute around it. Um, hence the new outfall and the small amount of slope, uh, you know, impact that we intend to fully stabilize post-construction. Okay. Um, any questions from board members on that? I'm zipping through my log here. I should just get their hand up. Okay. Um, and then I think the last uh, part of this application uh, is concerned the lighting. Um, so there is no lighting inside the addition. Is that correct? Uh, no, there will be lighting inside the addition. Uh, we would just propose that no lighting be over the, the 2000 lumens. Uh, oh, okay. And if it is, it, it would be shielded. Okay. So do you have a, like a lighting plan or a fixture that you're going to use or no, just, just going to work point, within those restrictions? Yeah. At this point, it would, it would primarily be down lights. Um, I could potentially see lights on the, the brick facade of alumni hall to illuminate that at night um, to show off the arched windows, but the intent would not to exceed the 2000 lumen uh, requirement. Okay. Um, I think that's good there. Um, okay. So I guess a little, um, a little bit more maybe about the shielding on the lights that are going to go in there. You said they're, you're going to stick to the 2000 lumen limit, um, and then things will just be down facing, uh, recess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they need to be you know, recessed can lights that, you know, push the light straight down, um, or they'd be indirect up lighting, maybe to light the, uh, the ceiling in there, depending on how we do the ceiling, but the intent would not to be have any bright spots, um, okay. vis visible from the street. That's, you know, they'll, they'll, from a code standpoint, they'll, they'll need to be emergency lighting, you know, that goes on an emergency, uh, sure. but, but otherwise the site lighting we're, we're, leaving the existing gooseneck lamps in place. Um, so our intent is that at night, this is not going to be an overly overly lit uh, structure. Not going to be glowing across the no. screen? <laughs> okay. We know how that would go over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, board members, are there other questions about this application that you would like to get addressed or issues that you would like to check into? I'd like to bring up the interior lighting again and the no glow features. Um, so will there be lighting on the interior of the building 24 hours a day? Uh, for Yeah, there'll probably be some low level safety lighting. Um, but beyond that, you know, 
there, like I said, there may be a, you know, a light that at night illuminates the the interior wall of alumni hall. That was, it's now an exterior wall just to show that off, but that would be at most the, the lighting that's in there. Um, I don't, know, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, so it will be dim. It'll be like a, yes. pen, a, a box with exit written on it and some light behind it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately that we're going to have an exit sign there. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, but the, the lights, uh, I can't speak for Elias, but I don't think the intent is to leave the lights on all night. I don't think they want to pay the electricity bill. <laughs> we want to save power. Yep. And those those lights will they'll be LED, they'll be on occupancy sensors and, and whatnot. So okay, that's helpful. Um other questions about the application? Yeah, so um I since we had a bit of discussion about the fence, I just saw the uh fence exhibit on page thirty-nine of the packet or thirty-nine of the application. Um and so we talked a lot about color we're ultimately deciding that we're not specifying but um am i correct in saying that it's it's what's pictured here on page 39 whereas the wood panels and then the black wrought iron is that what's envisioned or am i it would be something wood and metal not necessarily the black uh metal it would it could be white uh, but that's the the look of the fence we're, we're aiming for um, okay yeah Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, um, I would entertain a motion. Um, I think we want to. Uh, Sharon. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt. We have eight members. Only seven can vote. Oh, I'm Everybody sorry. Everybody could take part in the people. discussion, but either um, Jean Gene or, or Brian need to sort of recuse themselves as. Gentlemen, so, um, <laughs> or somebody's got to pick one of them. Uh, to not, one of you could count for this. One could count for the next application. Brian, you're needed. Oh. I'm okay uh, not voting, guys, on this. Okay, is that you, Brian? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll make the motion to uh, approve the application um for the vermont college property um as presented i think, I think that covers it i'll second the motion all right any further discussion that means that we are um ghosting the drc mm -hmm. recommendation so to speak Both? Uh, so it'll speak. be it'll be recognized in the findings of fact. I'm more concerned with the not having the conditions about the slopes requirements that's suggested right. in, on the last page of the staff report. Um, do you have your Do you have your staff report there, Kevin? Excuse me, Sharon. Do you have uh, Do you have the staff report that she's usually has the uh, memo of uh, the decision? I have it here to the motion to that. Um, it basically, she just wants to make sure that the stormwater disposal area and that um and that we get assigned um as stamped approved. There we go. I would motion to amend amend the uh uh, uh motion to uh, include a condition that prior to permit issuance, applicants should provide the zoning administrator with assigned and sealed engineering plans for stormwater dispersal area and the engineer's written statement um, of uh, no undue adverse impact. If needed, I'll second Rob's amendment. Okay. So, so, um, wait, so, so is, you make, an, you make a, an approval to the motion. I know. A modification to the, to the, to the, uh, to the motion that that's first. already yep. you, you don't take the, take the, the motion out. You keep it in play. I know. 
Okay, so okay. what we need to do now is have a vote on the motion that Rob just made and was seconded by Brian on modifying, was it Brian? No, Brian. Just, no. Joe, Joe, Joe seconded I'm, I'm sorry, the amendment. Right. Yeah, the, second with the, the amendment. The original, I, I made the original, the, the original um, approval. Um, and then, and then the second was made, and then in the discussion is what occurs, and you make a uh, a modification to the motion that's already on the table. Yes, yeah, so you don't have to do two votes, right, right Kevin? Yeah, okay. just one vote on the motion as amended or as modified. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um. So. <laughs> Without further discussion, let's um, <laughs> let's take a roll yeah. call on uh, this. Uh, Rob, yes. Uh, Kevin, yes. Uh, Jean, oh no, Jean's not yes. voting this time. Sorry, yes. Catherine. No, Jean oh, Jean is voting. voting. Oh, Jean. Yes. Oh, okay, Jean. <laughs> Joe, yes. Uh, Catherine, yes. Alex. Alex? Oh. Did you say, I saw her say yes. <laughs> okay. I now see her say yes, too. And uh, I also vote yes. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff, did you mean to have your hand up? I did. I, I wasn't trying to interrupt the vote, necessarily, but I just want a clarification for after. That's all. Okay. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to clarify uh, that based on the condition that was just read into the motion um, with regards to staff's comments on the stormwater, that the, the plans as presented meet the qualifications for that. You just need them stamped and that, and then the a supplemental letter. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Correct. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And without further, well, Meredith, do you want to say something? Oh, just to let, because um, I don't know as Elias has gone through this before or Mark okay. um, with the board here, that there'll be a written decision. Um, the vote you heard tonight and the decision the board made tonight isn't actually official until that written decision has been put forward and then signed. Um, and then I won't be able to actually issue the permit until I get that information from Jeff. Um, Jeff can go ahead and and work on that stuff, getting that the letter done if he needs some guidance for me on that. I can accept those before I actually, before the decision's actually written, um, if need be, and then we'll be able to move everything forward a little faster. Um, but yeah, the actual decision won't be effective until it's written and then the um, permit itself um, and the decision have a 30 day appeal period. Um, so just to keep you updated on process. And we will get that decision as soon as we can, um, but it does need to be written. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Application one. Thank uh, you very much. Thanks for your yeah. time. Have a good night. You too. Um, so our next application is, uh, the applicant is a Good Samaritan Haven. Um, people interested in uh, testifying, um, I'd like everybody to raise their right hands. Uh, if you do not have your video on, I guess at this point it would be good to turn your video on so that we can see you raise your right hands. Um, anybody who's planning on testifying. Okay. Uh, do you uh, solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yes. I do. I do. Okay, so that was uh, Zach, Ken, and Rick. And Don. And Don. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, Doug Zorzi. Okay. Uh, and I think Paul, Paul Kupkara, did you have your hand up? You can just put your hand up again or a thumbs up if your hand was up on that one. I, I did have my hand up, but I'm going to withdraw my hand just because it seems oh. like you got plenty of people testifying. Oh. <laughs> you can you can be sworn as in as a witness and still not talk if you don't want to. Uh, and and <clears throat> Alan, I know you were interested in this application. Do you think you might talk? You can, can you give it. Um, yes, yeah. I can. Yes, if I may, please. I'm raising my hand verbally. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Alan. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is conditional use and minor site plan review. Uh, the applicant is Good Samaritan Haven, and it is for the use of an existing building on the Country Club Road Project. Uh, Meredith, do you want to um, give a brief interview and then we'll, or overview, and then we'll go to the applicant? Yeah. Um, so there, there are no exterior changes with this proposal whatsoever. Um, the only reason that this is coming before the board is because um, temporary use as defined in our regulations, which does include um, emergency or homeless shelters, um, is a conditional use in this zoning district. Um, and so the, the board needs to make the approval. Um, it is a temporary request. There's a time limited approval window for this. Um, and so the, um, condition that I have suggested, um, for any approval is to make sure, um, that uh, for the use to occur beyond the April 30th, 2024 date, or for it to be further expanded within the building outside of the square footage that they've specified would require a new permit. Um, but other than that, um, there's, you know, the board needs to go through those conditional use yeah. um, requirements. Okay. I think that's very helpful. Um, who is presenting for the applicant? Uh, Rick DeAngelis, um, co-director of the Good Samaritan Haven. Great. Hi, Rick. Um, nice do you want to do a little overview of, of what we've got going yeah, on there? Yeah. I, yeah, I have a few brief comments to make. I'd like to give you some context. Uh, we do understand that this is a conditional use in this district, um, but um, I want to just explain why we think it uh, you should vote uh, to approve it. And uh, we're in support of the staff recommendation with the condition that was cited. You know, there are some compelling reasons why this should be approved. And um, one in particular is it's in response to a housing crisis of um, really historic dimensions here in central Vermont. Um, I've been working in housing in central Vermont for over 30 years never seen conditions quite like this before. And uh, there are a lot of people who are out there with nowhere to go. And many of them live here in Montpelier or are on the streets here in Montpelier. Uh, you know, the second um, reason why I think this is a very urgent and special circumstance is that if not for the events of July 10th and the flooding that took place, we probably wouldn't even be here tonight uh, we were working very hard to um, secure a location in the downtown area. And uh, unfortunately, it was badly flooded and it just wasn't practical uh, to continue with that option. Uh, and then my final comment is, and I guess this is more having to do with the, you know, the question about impacts. What kind of impacts is this project going to have? And... Um, you know, from day one, we have been working in close collaboration with the city of Montpelier. In fact, they actually suggested this site and uh, as a as a good alternative, and uh, and that includes uh, public safety officials. Uh, we've met with the chief and um, emergency sur uh, police of ch uh, chief of police and emergency services. And we think we have a, a plan that's going to result in a safe operation and have, you know, negligible impacts on the surrounding area. So um, I guess that's it. I'm glad to respond to any questions and um, thank you for considering us. Sure. Sure. Um, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Rick, why do you think what 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 is driving the numbers up so high? Because I I I, I see that physical ev evidence every day every day when I'm downtown, and and it is definitely unprecedented in the time I've I've lived in uh, Montpelier, which is over forty years now. Um, so I mean, what what what's the what's the big big picture? 
Well, gee, if I could answer that question, I could. I was about to say time. that's a big one. Right. It's uh, it's complicated. You know, I guess that the foundation of it, in my opinion, is something has happened with the housing markets, really nationally, and um, you know that bottom end of the rental housing market has dried out quite a bit. And um, and then there are some other factors that feed into that. I mean, extreme poverty, um, you know, a, a drug crisis like we've never seen before, uh, you know, mental health issues and other things. So, you yeah. know, for lack of uh, uh, a better phrase, it's really a perfect storm of a lot of factors that have come together. And I really do think Montpelier is something of um, not a unique place, but... Um, there's a very high number of unsheltered people um, who are trying to get by in Montpelier and the surrounding areas. And yeah. um, so it's really important that the shelter be somewhere in Montpelier. And um, I think and that's just so such that's a big why... question. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, we've got a very large unsheltered population here. And um, so we feel, believe me, we're not wildly enthusiastic about running uh, seasonal overflow shelters, but we really felt we had to do it this year. Okay. Um, so do we, is any, uh, Paul, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, we were recently hired by the city of Montpelier to do a study of homelessness in the area and come up with some solutions. And I just wanted to add, uh, Montpelier has one of the lowest housing vacancy rates uh, in the state of Vermont and in this region. Um, and I just had two homeless people living in my house for the last seven months. They were both employed um, and were completely unable to find an affordable place to rent um, for seven months. It took them seven months to find like find a place. So I think a big driver of this problem is just the lack of housing in general um, and then a lack of affordable housing right now in the Montpelier community, especially with the floods displacing quite a few additional people. Um, there, there's just not places out there to rent, even if you do have an income, you know, particularly if you have low income. Thank you. I think that's very true. Um, <clears throat> it is a gigantic problem for our community and especially for those people who are without housing. Um, let's maybe uh, get started on some of the general standards that we need to look at here. Um, this is uh, under the general standards. This uh, temporary housing is a lodging used to find as emergency shelter or homeless shelter. Uh, I think we clearly qualify there. Paul, can you take your hand down or did you want to speak again? I'm sorry. I'll take my hand down. I'm trying to figure out how to. <laughs> That's all right. I'm just trying to <laughs> make sure everybody oh, oh, gets a chance to speak. Okay. Um, so this definitely seems like it qualifies to me as a temporary structure. Um, means the use of structures that should be occurring or located in a parcel for a limited and fixed period of time, um, after which are no evidence of that use. Uh, so I feel like that definitely matches up with uh, the request. There is, um, I think the most relevant parts for us, and I don't mean to just totally hop around, but um, I guess the next thing up is uh, landscaping, where uh, Meredith points out that we could actually require additional landscaping. My feeling is that this is, they're not doing anything to alter the outside of the building, and it's a temporary um, it's a temporary shelter meant for, a, you know, meant for November through April. And so that landscaping is just a non-starter here. Other board members? I agree with that. Yeah, I agree. I agree, I agree as well. Okay. Um, also agree. Yep. Great. Um, we're not going to worry about that. Uh the other thing that we need to find here is that we um, that the proposal does not cause a disproportionate or unreasonable burden on the city's ability to provide community facilities, um, and that uh, you know, given the size of the of what has been up there, twenty people seems like you know. I, I think that uh, in the application itself, it said there were only two bathrooms, so and no showers. So you know, the utility's not bad. There's not going on. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, but there's no 
Uh, there's no children uh, in the shelter. Is that right? That's that's correct, Sharon. Okay. Uh, so uh, I don't I don't see where it would create any disproportionate or unreasonable burden on the city's abilities. Other board members? No. No. Uh, uh, Doug, did you want? As far as facilities go, uh, you said two bathrooms, Sharon? Yeah, I think that's what the proposal says. Yeah. So is there any proposal to to add or recommendations to add showers to those bathrooms? Uh, it's no. not mentioned in the proposal. Okay. Um, Doug, okay. did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm also. I... No, she's trying to call on Doug Zorzi. And he's had his hand up, but he has his mute button on. The mute? Can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can now. Yes. Okay, I apologize. No um, for the record, my name's Doug Zorzi. I'm one of the owners of Saban's Pasture. Um, please appreciate that the owners are supportive of the city's efforts to provide temporary housing for the affected flood persons. We have one question, if you would, please. What will be the city's position in the event that additional time is needed um, at the end of the temporary housing period? So I'm sorry, are you asking what the applicant's plans are? Or, or what I, cause I don't think that we can really speak to what how the city will respond. You know okay. that's you know what I mean. That's kind of out of our our, our ballywick there. Meredith, yeah. um, can we switch over to Meredith here? She looks like she's got something to say. So, Doug, I just I just want to clarify. So, what this is what this application is for is for the good samaritan just overnight shelter like beds this is separate from the fema housing that is the city that is a separate city project that's city and fema so what we're talking about tonight is just moving of what had been an overnight only overflow shelter that had been downtown up to the existing um clubhouse building for just this winter right it's just a one winter overnight overflow place where they're going to be bussed up for the, in the evenings and then leave in the morning this is not the fema housing that's a whole separate matter okay i was going Confused given cities um notice for tonight yep so you got that notice yeah yeah so th so that was so th so right now all of the fema discussions are happening at the city council level um and there there will be new hearings at the city council level about emergency changes to the zoning regulations to um potentially affect being able to make approve that fema housing that's a whole separate thing than what we're talking about tonight Meredith, oh, that, uh, no, there would be no DRB interaction. Um, uh, based on my understanding of the proposal that went to city council, right, that'll be separate. Um, so I would suggest that you you can email my, Mike Miller mm -hmm. um, to get an idea of when those hearings may be happening. Um, but yeah, that's that's separate from tonight's application. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um. I'm just looking through for any hands here. See anybody? Okay. Um, all right. So we're on unreasonable burden. Uh, the next thing is um, that we determine, determine the volume, type, and timing of the traffic generated by the proposed development. Um, and that seemed pretty clear to me, but maybe we could just, uh, Rick, if you want to just speak to that, um, what um, what you see the site generating for traffic? Uh, we're making it a very, very high priority to limit uh, people uh, coming only by a bus that we're going to be operating. So my expectation is that there will be a bus, so, you know, a passenger van, 15 person passenger van, and maybe one or two staff vehicles every night. So not a, not a large presence of traffic or parking. 
Uh, I, I think that um, that certainly is not uh, dissimilar to other uses in the neighborhood. It sounds actually less than what other neighbors are probably doing at this point. Um, there is a concern here about the character of the neighborhood, or at least in something in red. The farm and factory neighborhood is described as primarily industrial with a number of businesses connected to agriculture. Proposed development should support ongoing industrial uses, compatible mixed use development mm -hmm. to enhance the character of the neighborhood uh, with well designed buildings. Um, this doesn't seem relevant because we're not adding any uh <laughs> not adding anything so um the next thing that uh that we just need to look at quickly i think is whether there's any uh, enough information the conditional use standards um let me see here I, I just feel like uh, most of these things um, that are listed in the conditional use requirements, you know, noise, lighting, odors, uh, this is all just all included um, inside the a building. There's no additional building. There's no additional, I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about three vehicles. Um, do other board members have concerns about uh, traffic or exterior changes or landscaping? I have a question. Okay. Um the proposal says that they will be using a dedicated entrance um, with a smoking area outside. I got no issues with that, but I had a trouble figuring out what the entrance was and how it related. I assume there's still a child care facility there. It's on the, uh, uh, I think the map is on the entrance is on the West side. Is that right, Meredith? Mm -hmm. And the um, daycare is on the, uh, Outside. Right. I was looking at a multicolored map. It was a floor plan. Oh. Could you put that one up, Meredith? I think it might be more helpful to look at the So so here's it's it's so this is the this is the floor plan, right? Um and here is the building entrance that would be used for this what's currently um like an office space that would be converted. Right. This is facing um uh, all right. Uh, well, it, it's, it, it's facing this parking lot, right? So yeah. here's the Country Club Road that comes up. This way is actually north, right? This is upside okay. down um, because the uh, Route 2 is down here. Mm -hmm. um, so you come up Country Club Road, you go all the way to the end here. This is the paved parking lot here. Um, and here's the entrance here for the, the shelter. There's a big gravel parking lot here that connects over these this like pathway and road and entrance. And here is the entrance to the child care center. Okay, um, and, and it, yep. And they'd all also be operating at different times, right? Um, because here, you, I don't know the exact hours, but they'd be arriving in the evening and leaving in the morning versus they would be arriving in the morning, leaving in the in the afternoon to early evening probably i don't know exactly what their hours are right right and the, the application says they would be out by 8 a.m which is a somewhat of a window yeah but i couldn't nope. figure out where the entrance on this on the color yep. floor plan i couldn't figure out where the entrance <laughs> where the daycare was yep so the entrance for the daycares you can see all these little doors here um so the child care is here and here's the I don't, I don't remember which one of these is the actual entrance i think it's this one okay. um, and that's, and that's, and that's, a, and that's a, uh, a an operation that that's ongoing correct i mean it's still it's being used now yes and i i confirmed that because i know there were some issues at one point with, right. with the space when it was shut down for yeah. a little while um but yes the, the daycare center is running right now and um this is an old floor plan um and so i i can't imagine that for a child care center they've got four doors that would be a little hard to secure they probably have to have two for fire safety um uh right. and it looks like rick Two of them were marked, and then these were not marked except by the – there wasn't a legend, so I didn't know yeah. exactly what the little things were. And and I'm thinking back to what happened to the sculpture on the sculpture bench area on the um, 
bike path and the kind of rubbing together that didn't go very well. And also when it got moved downtown and just wanting to make sure that there wasn't any um, rubbing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep, and that's the child care center has its own bathrooms in here that you can see. Okay. So they've, they, okay. it's this versus this is going to be a separate space, right? There's okay. a, there's no, this is a solid wall here between right. so the child care center and these spaces. Right. So that there's no chance for sort of paranoid response. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I see that Rick had his hand up. Rick? Yeah, just for some background, the child care business is leaving. And um, they told us that they would be out by Thanksgiving. Oh. Um, and I'm, pr I'm pretty sure they'd given notice to the city as well. So, yeah. Uh, and we have talked with them. We've, we've been in communication. They seem to be supportive of what we're doing and so forth. Good. Okay. Good. Um, Jean, I see your hand up. So the is are we just talking the common area or the entire building is, is I guess because we were highlighted by by different color and different sections of that building. Um, so that's the common area is. So you're looking for that? What color is the? So I'm just my my question is is the entire space the the entire building going to be occupied or just that specific area? Gene, oh, the existing it. existing office number two, the one thousand nine hundred fifty one square feet, which is the blue, yes. is going right. to be the the space, and they'll have access to these bathrooms okay. in this common space. This will be their entrance, right, right. and there's the bathroom. So, so, but this, you know. Who knows? During the occupancy over the winter, maybe some other office use. Who yeah. knows? I might be up there, right? The planning department might get moved into this space <laughs> yeah. in green, okay, I right? See. Yeah, right? And right. we would use these bathrooms during the day, right? On. And then this space here, but it's just the the one thousand nine hundred fifty one square feet of space is being converted temporarily to the temporary housing. Can I ask another question? Just a as far as good for Rick, uh, um, so 8 a.m. comes around in a February morning. It's negative 30 degrees outside mm -hmm. with a foot of snow. What's this? I mean, what's the scenario right there? You're just all these people have to leave? Uh, yes. Um, you know, one thing that we have to do for to assure that there is people are safe uh, is um, and also to re re receive funding to to operate this, we have to demonstrate that people have places to go when we're closed. So there are you know there are a handful of options that um, that individuals who use the shelter might go to during the day. Uh, one of the most important ones is another way, which is represented by Ken Russell, who's here tonight. Okay. Um, also, the bus station in downtown Montpelier is also open uh, from 8 until 6.30 each evening. So not ideal. If there's not an aspect of this that is ideal, let me tell you. This is... Um, right. This is kind of damage control and trying to make the best out of a very challenging situation um but what we're going to take provide is the overnight shelter thanks rick um so yeah i just want to follow up to that i mean i think yeah. that it's important to point out that it doesn't appear that um based on the drp's approval and discussion that the time frame for the conditional use of this is anything that we're mandating through our permit um you know, to say that, like, we're not saying based on our GRP approval this application, if we were to approve it, that the residents have to be out by 8 a.m. That's another consideration um, to be to be had. Um, well, just, I mean, I think I think that is uh, that is actually part of the application. That is, it is stated in there. You know that that's that that's you know what what they're saying they're going to do. Um, so, p.m. to late a.m. 
is the language in the right. Uh, by the way, it's part of our lease agreement with the city of Montpelier too. Okay. And yeah, that takes care of it nicely. Um And I think just Meredith pointing out, um, and I think that that was heard by you guys that uh, that any changes in use or extension or anything like that would need to come back to the board for an additional permit. So just a um, note, the, the condition I wrote said it would need a new zoning permit if the zoning regulations changed between now and when they needed a new permit so that it didn't need to go to the DRB it wouldn't go to the DRB is the way I wrote it. So if you want to change it so that it has to come back to the DRB, no matter what, that's a separate thing. I don't want to do that. I want to stick with the zoning regulations <laughs> so that and that um, that we are basically, if the zoning regulations indicate that they need a permit, then they will have to come back to us and get a permit. We will not be making extra work. <laughs> um, other questions, ideas, concerns, anybody? Uh, who wants to speak who did not get a chance to speak um this is zach um Hi, zach. to be recognized i mean i'm in support of this uh for a number of reasons including that i i do a lot of outreach in the community and i worked with a gentleman who came in from out of state a couple years ago and if it hadn't been for this type of thing he would have been uh probably dead um it's very cold out uh we were working in those uh conditions that you're talking about i also worked in the overflow shelter last year i can speak that we do move people to uh, but another location regardless of the 30 degree below zero outside um so you know i feel very confident in uh supporting this project um and just know the, the the problem will be ongoing, you know, so it's it's not really going to go away. This is a great crew, um, and I've worked with them in another way, and I feel very confident, and I'm in support of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, thank you for um, you know bringing the project and introducing it today, and also starting with the, the overall context around the housing access crisis and the the need for shelter. I had a, a question around um, you know the earlier discussion on the need for folks to leave the site during the day, given there are also um, you know points that we're reviewing around uh, traffic and use, which personally I think is. Uh, you know, there's this is a large site with minimal use, but I did think it'd be helpful for you to state for the record whether um, you all are you're providing any connective transportation, especially with um, the weather considerations for the winter. You know, when people need to leave, do they have support to um, get to other locations that are safe and warm during the day? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, uh, we are providing connective transportation. We'll be running a shuttle bus uh, each evening and each morning, uh, making you know two, two uh, circuits mm -hmm. of the downtown area. And, um, and, um, and we'll be working in other ways to make sure that there are um, some reasonable alternatives for people to go to. Okay, thank you. Ken had his hand up. I'm sorry, Gene. One. Oh, Ken had his hand up earlier. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Hi. Yeah. You know, I'm in strong support of this. Um, it's as Rick suggests. It's. I mean, it's an ongoing crisis. Um, folks fall through the cracks everywhere. Um, just honestly, um, glad. I, I'm the. By the way, I'm the director of Another Way, and I'm also the the chair of the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force. And I'm just really glad to hear all of your all's awareness of the of these situations, and hope that our our town can you know stay strong and and, and being able to problem solve with in a really difficult situation. So um, strong support of this. Over. Thanks, Ken. Okay. Um, is someone willing to I'd make like a motion? To make a motion. 
Who's speaking? Oh, I'd like to entertain a motion if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that'd so, be great. Unless we missed anything else. Um, Just who's voting? Because again, either oh, Brian okay. or Jean needs to not be voting. So if Jean's making a motion, then probably Brian needs to not vote again. Uh, I think I think that's good. I would um, when we have two alternates, I would propose that um, we can talk about this a little bit later, but that we pick one for the evening versus going back and forth during on um, projects. That's, just with, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I just so, wanted to make sure because we didn't make that clear in the other one whether it was for the whole evening or not. Okay. Okay. So, Gene. Yeah, motion to grant the request for conditional use of minor set site plan approval for the 1,950 square foot temporary housing used for an overnight homeless shelter at 203 Country Club Road, operating from November 1st to 2023 through April 30th of 2024, as presented in the application number Z-2023-0110. And supporting and supplemental materials. Any use of additional space at 203 Country Club Road for temporary housing or for the use to occur beyond April 30th of 2024 requires a new zoning permit. Um, Meredith, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what happens if um good samaritan would like to use additional space given that the child center is leaving for example right before the new zoning regs are in uh they they'd have to come back to the board for an amendment to the open permit but you're thinking that the new zone emergency zoning regs will be in place you um so that that's that's for so that emergency zoning regulation that I referenced in response to um, the other questions, that is for a different style use. That is for the FEMA housing. It's going to be, uh, th those are changes for a new category of use that fits to that specific kind of um, government sponsored longer term residential use versus just an overnight, which is a lodging use, right? That so the the residential uses are more than thirty days, um, and that's well, a, that's going to be a completely separate thing. And there's mutually, there's mutually exclusive. Yes, I just wanted to second so we could get to the discussion phase. Oh, sorry, thank you. That's okay. <laughs> okay, I think, we, I think we cleared it up. So so we have a uh, motion by Jean and a second by Karen. Um, do we have any further discussion? I think, um, I don't know, I guess I did want to bring back up, just to be clear on this, uh, given that we're issuing a temporary permit for a time period here. Uh, the the hours don't quite make sense to me with, like, what's presented in the application. And, like, maybe we can clarify that. I mean, I see where in the application they state about the uh, usage of, um, like, sewer and water and stormwater. 20 guests between 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. Um, but I don't necessarily translate that to like, you know, this conditional use is for this these dates from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. You know, for this for the for this space. And I don't think we have to be so specific. Um, and, and and what I say is that like, you know, I think that, that like if there were an emergency situation where they needed to use the space for a temporary shelter outside the hours and. I, I understand there's a city lease or whatnot, um, but like I would just hate for them to have to come to the DRB, <laughs> uh, you know, because the out, you know, their the hours are in the permit are not adding up. But uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm reading it completely wrong. I don't know. <laughs> so um, would you? Um, what are you thinking, Rob? To just take the hours out just, of the permit? I think just make it clear, make it clear that like the permit and the conditional uses like for, you know, for 24 seven between the hours of, you know, between the dates at which we, per, you know, per, provide and yeah, maybe there's other triggers and other factors that, um, you know, restrict it to be, um, you know, 6 p.m. to, you know, 8, 8 a.m. or whatever. But I don't, I don't think that like the, 
the approval from the DRB needs to restrict it to that. Seems to be some confusion. The uh, yeah, the, 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 the the motion as as has as it exists right now doesn't talk it's about not restrictive. The hours. It's not restricting about hours. Right, not at all, Rob. So I think I think your sure. your your concern is met by the existing sure. language as we have it now. Meredith's other hand up. <laughs> and it, uh, it Sharon, my screen. It's okay, Sharon. Are you okay if I just give a little yeah. note here? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, there. In, in the typical way, we I would do this, and I would write this, and that we've done this in the past for the board. There are often findings of fact about what an applicant represents. That is what they will be doing. Um that um, are part of the factors that go it to meeting certain criteria. Um, and so those sort of become implied conditions of approval. Those are still often a lot harder to try and enforce on and say somebody is not meeting those conditions as compared to strict specified conditions of approval that the board puts at the end of a decision. Um, so uh, yes, the hours of operation are sort of an implied condition of approval because it does go to, to at least some degree, the um, conditional use, you know, lack of impact on the character of the neighborhood. If the board feels like they want to say, you know, have a little clause, even if this were a 24 seven, you know, shelter, we don't see that there would be an impact on the character of the neighborhood. You could do that um, within that conditional use review discussion. Um, that that would really be the only way I could see about jiggering this because I mean, that, that time limit is already in the application materials about when they said they would be operating it. Um, so the board doesn't really have a an option to just excise that from the record. It's in there as they've represented. This is what they're doing. Does that make I mean, sense, Rob? No, that makes I mean, that makes perfect sense. And I think what you talked about the you know the findings of fact, and I think that what I am maybe recommending is that like we, we don't say that that time period is part of our finding of fact related to the uh, you know conditional use standards related you know as how many you know. What, what facilities are there and you know you know you know and whatnot like that that's the information that was provided in the application but uh there is clearly enough uh you know water supply sewer and stormwater infrastructure to you know fit 20 guests for you know 20 you know 20, 24 7 like that's fine like we're not relying on the fact that they said six to eight to say that six six p.m to eight a.m to say that their community facilities are you know are, are sufficient it's like well, we're totally. not uh, I, I, I get that, but I also get that, I mean, what Meredith just said is that that's what the application has asked for. That's the application that we reviewed and that because it's included in the application, it is still kind of part of everything, but it's not, uh, it's not held to the same enforceability level that a specific, um, thing is. And I just, and I feel, I feel weird about changing it. Um, you know, in terms of like, they, put this on their application and we're go also going to say, by the way, if you want to do something different 24 seven, that's fine. I just, I just, I'm uncomfortable with that actually. Uh, yeah, and so because. And that was my feeling too, Sharon. Thank you for yeah, stating that. And it's not like, it's not like the staff report emphasizes that a whole lot. Right. But there are reasons, you know, that's one of the reasons there's going to be lower traffic, right? You're talking traffic at two points during the day. Um, so it comes into play, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's so emphasized that it's going to be an issue. And I would just say that I feel like we, you know, that uh, it's very clear that the board thinks that this is a great thing that's happening uh, and that um, and we would obviously uh, try to deal in a timely fashion with any any further requests for changes of um, usage or time or whatever. If that was necessary, we would um, definitely want to move on that quickly. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I appreciate the discussion. I just I need some clarification on that, and I think that um, the motion that's presented is uh, you know is is great, and um, I'm ready to vote yes. Okay, <laughs> give me a list here. 
Um, so, uh, Rob, how do you vote? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Uh, Joe? Yes. Okay. Uh, Catherine? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jean? Yes. Alex? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that, uh, so Meredith, you want to give him a spiel about uh, when he's got to get his stuff? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, no, there's no um, conditions prior to permit issuance on this one. So we will get that decision written as quickly as possible. I have two decisions to work on now. Um, and then once that decision is signed by the chair, I will be able to actually get you the decision and the permit at the same time. Um, so we will get that as soon as possible, Rick. Um, and just watch for an email for us from us because um, with these decisions, if we mail them, we're supposed to do it certified mail. And that has not been working well for a couple of years now. So the decisions, we usually have people come and pick up and sign a little slip, um, especially because because we, we still haven't replaced our certified mail forms that got washed away. Um, <laughs> so, so picking up decisions and you'll get your permit at the same time. Yeah. Hey, guys, I just want to thank you. And uh, Meredith, thanks for the uh, helping with the application. And I really appreciate the thoughtful consideration tonight. Great. Thank you. You're welcome, Rick. Um, so we need to take a look at some minutes, um, of the approval of the last meeting, which was 9-18-23. Did everybody get a chance to look at those? Yeah. Um, I didn't see any changes that needed to be made. Meredith? <laughs> So confession, I didn't actually review these meeting, meeting minutes after the secretary did them um, before sending them all out to y'all. Um, and well, yep, yeah, because I don't think Jean was actually at that meeting. Um, so that changes the list of those present and the votes. So correct. things should be approved five to zero because Jean, you weren't at the last meeting, right? You could it's not. Yep. Um, and then at the bottom of the first page, um, we don't actually have the vote noted there on 12 J Street. So I need to add in approved five to nothing. Um, and then same for the adjournment um, note. It just says Kevin made a motion to adjourn. So I have to add Joe seconded and then adjourned unanimously. So if, if those are the only changes I spotted, if you guys are good with those changes, um, then that's great. We could great. have a motion to approve with those changes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? And second, if you weren't at the meeting. Oh, I wasn't at the meeting, sorry. I wasn't second at the meeting <laughs> either. <laughs> I know okay. they all look the same, but they're not. <laughs> the meeting has a second. Yeah. I'll, I'll second it. Great, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. It passed yeah. unanimously. I was and I wasn't there in case that's relevant information. So it 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 doesn't really matter with the revised rules. Okay. Um so do I do, I just wanted to quickly touch on the um alternate thing where if we have two alternates that are here and only one of them is voting, I think we should figure out early on in the meeting who that voting member is going to be. And I think just for organizational sake, it would be nice if it was one person so that we didn't, you know, kind of flip back and forth between alternates yeah. in the same evening. Um, yeah, that and, sounds and just, great. Okay, Meredith likes it. How about the rest of you guys? Yeah, I think that makes sense, Sharon. Okay. That's a yeah. good, good idea. Okay. okay. And then if that's um, set... If that's said at the beginning of the meeting, just for the record yeah. uh, and for minutes purposes, and then, you know, whoever, however the discussion votes, what, you know, works out, whatever, everybody can right. still be involved, but then we know who's voting. So thank you. I appreciate that, Sharon. Okay. I have um, our next meeting is the, what? Yes. I have, I have two questions, quick ones. Okay. Sure. One is I was looking at the minutes and I realized that there's no time on them. There's no time for when the meeting starts and when the meeting ends. And I don't know whether that's just 
longstanding practice that I hadn't noticed before <laughs> or whether it's something that we care about. That's question one. And question two is, how do you get those those PDFs that you show us on your share screen down to screen size? I mean, Catherine talked about dealing with the PDF. The minute it switches from text to engineered drawings or something, it's almost impossible to manage on the screen for me. Um, yep. I, I would need to look and see what program you're using. Um, you know, I can do it really easily because I have Adobe Pro. Oh. Um, so I think you can do that in regular Adobe too, but the functioning is a little differently. Um, so if you're using a laptop to do this, feel free to bring it in and I'm happy to play with it with you to, to help figure it out. Um, I mean, that's, I'm happy to do that for you. If you want to just email me when sometimes might work for you. Um, and then I can see if I can figure it out for you. Um, because I know it is a pain. The other thing is, though, on the screen, because some of these, if I try and print them out, even on 11 by 17, the font and everything is still so tiny that you can't right. see it. Right. Thank you. Um, and the minutes, the timing thing, I, I, it's been the way the minutes have been drafted since before I started here five years ago, is not having those times in. Um I'm not sure it's actually a required aspect. I know that for some meeting minutes, they try and keep the times of the actual votes going. I think that because these meetings are recorded and we keep videos of them, um, it's felt like that's not quite as essential as my understanding. Um, but we could add it in at some point if the board felt like they wanted to have those times in there. It, frankly, it occurred to me because the J Street application for which I was not present seemed really open and shut. And I thought, oh, I wonder if they got out of there in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I could ask the recording secretary to start to put in like the. I really don't need to know. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, in a way that little pieces of information are often interesting, if not important. That's all. <laughs> that's funny. I think when I was on the DRM before that the whole agenda was um, timed out. I mean, it was like start Whoa. here, yeah, and then yeah. And you have the record video. You can just go back and watch the whole thing if you really but, want. But never, you really never. Want. <laughs> <laughs> um, Meredith, do we have anything on the books for the sixteenth? We don't, which is why it was TBD, because we didn't know if something tonight was going to be continued. Um, so we actually have no applications that have been noticed for the 16th. So unless the board has some pressing matter that they want to meet on, um, I don't have anything for that agenda. And so the board can say it's not going to meet then. Uh, anybody have any pressing they'd like to get together and talk about? <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't say that I do, but okay. Then the next meeting would be November sixth because there is an extra Monday in October. So there's uh, two, what three weeks before we meet again? One, two, three. Hmm. Okay. Do we have All a right. um, trajectory for an in-person meeting spot, or is that TBD? Uh, that's that's yeah, that's still TBD. Um. It, trying to find a spot that would let us do the hybrid with the Orca recording and Zoom um, is a little tricksy. So I don't have a spot for that yet. Yeah. Um, and actually right now, I don't have any, I don't even have any applications for November 6th right now because we haven't hit the deadline for that and nothing has come in yet. So yeah. Did you check for the uh, city league of city and towns? Um, honestly, I have been way too busy to try and actually even reach out just yet. Um, totally and totally before just I curious. reach out and honestly, before I reach out to them, I really need to coordinate with the upper level management um, because I know they've reached out to a whole bunch of people when they were trying to get a space for city council to meet. Um, because city council has been holding some in-person meetings um, and they're using the high school, I can't remember if it's the auditorium or the gym now for in-person city council, but that's not necessarily going to be available, um, you know, as many nights a week, a month as we would need it for both city council and DRB. 
And if I was going to do that, I'd have to do DRC there too, because I can't get from here to there in five minutes and set up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's enough discussion about that. <laughs> well, I, I, guess, I guess I would just to make sure that it's, you know, clear enough for you, Meredith, because I know that you're doing everything you can to, you know, do it, do things, do, do things the right way. But, uh, you know, I think that the, the Zoom platform is not a, a replacement uh, for the in-person function of the citizen board, you know, process. Um, oh, and, I agree. Uh, you know, whenever it, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the opportunity, uh, you know, that comes aboard that, you know, to, to return to that, uh, you know, we, we look forward to that, but we also understand that it'll take as long as it takes. Um, and so I just want to make sure Thank that, you. you know, I think folks know that I, that I feel that way. I think other members of this board feel that way. And um, so, yeah. For yeah. Sure. No. Oh, go ahead. I'll say I definitely agree. I think we as a board, you know, we can get the job done and perform well all remote, but it, it's definitely preferable to be able to be both working, you know, together in the room and then also for um, the applicant and interested residents to have the option to be in person or remote. So uh, my apologies for squirreling up the um, people's hands raising today. I'll get better at that as I'm learning to manage the multiple Zoom factor here. You did great. You did yeah. great. You did a good job, Sharon. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn, perhaps? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.